Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to uh, wait a little bit here while people come in from the waiting room. Uh, and that is just a process and it takes a few minutes. But the uh, chat is currently live. If you would uh, maybe like to tell us where you're uh, tuning in from, uh, one of the cool things about being online is that we can uh, reach out to people who are maybe a little further afield than we are normally able to. Um, so it's always cool to see if people are coming in from uh, a bit of a distance or uh, closer to home too. Um, and I see we're, we're starting to um, be able to get some of the folks in from the, the waiting room, which is nice. Um, and you should be able to see the, the chat feature on the bottom if you want to, um, you know, throw a, a shout out to where you're coming from. <laughs> Minnetonka, excellent. Scandia. All right, both ends. Hudson, whoa, they're coming in faster now. DC I saw in there. <clears throat> Southern Indiana, St. Paul, St. Paul, all right. Oh my goodness, it's going so quickly, I can hardly keep up. Uh, Kansas I saw for a second, Vermont. People are coming in from all over the place. Minneapolis. Greenland. For real, Greenland. <laughs> I mean, that would be awesome. <laughs> UK. Hey, okay, excellent. Otona, nice. Ma perfect, good, <laughs> interstellar. I'm glad we managed some reach, that's good. <laughs> Um, so it looks like uh, we've got a, a decent number of people here. Um, my name's Alex Iles. I am your uh, MC and moderator for Petri Dish, uh, which is brought to you by the College of Biological Sciences at the University of Minnesota um, in collaboration with the Bell Museum. For those of you that haven't attended a Petri Dish in the past or have only attended in the past year or so, um, normally we hold this uh, in person and we uh, hold it in a, in a bar um, and it's a live event. Um, and the idea behind that is that this is meant to be a, a fairly casual event, kind of a fun conversation around topics that people might find of kind of broad interest. Um, so we've moved online for the time being, like most things have, um, and we're hoping that we will be able to uh, perhaps uh, meet in person again in the not too distant future. Uh, before we get started with our very cool topic tonight of the origins of life, um, I want to make a few quick announcements. Um, coming up at the Bell Museum, um, there is the uh, November virtual star party uh, this Friday, and uh, that's November 19th uh, from 7 to 830 um, and this is where the planetarium team is going to uh, dig into the upcoming history making uh, Artemis mission and share live views of the moon and night sky objects. Uh, also on uh, Saturday, December 11th, the Bell will be hosting another in-person uh, spotlight science focused on uh, Minnesota fish and recreation. Uh, so there you'll get to meet uh, researchers and outreach specialists from the Minnesota DNR and the uh, Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Center. Um, and you can find more information about that uh, right there on that website uh, at the uh, bellmuseum.umn.edu. This evening, however, we have three university researchers here uh, for what promises to be a really, really cool conversation. I'm so stoked about this. Um, we typically kick things off with a little bit of uh, trivia. Um, and so we're going to uh, do that again, but it's going to be trivia in uh, sort of a Zoom poll format. And uh, Claire uh, Wilson, who I'd like to invite in, um, is going to be leading that. Uh, Claire is a science communicator who translates complex research for a general audience. So Claire, if you could uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Alex. So like Alex said, we're going to do some trivia. Um, you'll notice on trivia that some questions might have a right answer and some questions might spark some more discussion. Um, and so just be prepared that this is maybe not the traditional trivia that you're, you're used to. So let's get things going with the first question here. When studying the origin of life, what is the sample size researchers work with?
Give it another five seconds here. So, so we have a range of answers here and uh, maybe my wording of this was a little confusing, but I would argue that you're, you're really, we only have N of one and that earth is the only system where we, we have, we have discovered life that is currently living, right? We found evidence of life, but um, so in that case, I would say one would be the right answer for that. Now, when you get down to the nitty gritty of, of, you know, when you're actually setting up a experiment in the lab, it might look a little bit different. And I'm sure the panelists will get to what that might look like here in a second. Okay, on to question two. A well-known theory about the origin of life is called what? Claire, I really want to put D turkey soup. <laughs> I thought about it. I thought about it. So let's give it another five seconds or so here to people for people to roll in their answers. And it looks like the overwhelming majority did in fact uh, select the correct answer, which is primordial soup. Uh, when I was doing some research and thinking about trivia questions earlier today and yesterday, uh, you know, primordial soup came up as a theory that's been around for a little while. Another name for this theory is prebiotic broth. Um, so I'm surprised not more people went for the, the broth themed theory. So a lot of, a lot of broth and soup analogies, it seems like in, in, um, in these theories. Perfect for Thanksgiving. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So our third question here. What came first? <laughs> Did you have to make that a single choice? I know. Uh, I didn't, I, you know, more, more conversation, right, Alex, of who chooses what. So let's give it another five seconds here. And I was inspired by this question from an earlier conversation I had with Dr. Seeley last winter when we were talking about a new grant that I'm sure he'll discuss later today. Um, and he said, you know, part of the research, it's, it's a little bit chicken or egg, right? So I'm sure, I'm sure much of the discussion today will talk a little bit about this. Okay, so it seems like we're a little bit more on the egg side for this audience. So good to know panelists who you're kind of dealing with and what people are thinking. And the final question tonight before we launch into the event, is what came first, DNA, RNA, or proteins? And again, as Alex said, I could probably have to select all or select multiple. Do another five seconds or so to get get people's questions in, questions in, responses in rather. They might have I questions. Even a beer. I haven't even opened a beer yet. <laughs> All right, so it seems like this audience skews slightly towards leaning towards proteins, um, as thinking that proteins might have been the first, the first player on the scene. So thanks for putting up with the slightly unconventional trivia, but I felt like this topic merited slightly more philosophical questions. So I'm excited to see where the conversation goes for the rest of the event. Uh, thanks, Claire. I liked your un unconventional questions. <laughs> uh, so. Now I would like to uh, introduce uh, the Dean of the College of Biological Sciences, uh, Valerie Forbes, to uh, uh, say a few words. Well, thank you, Alex. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the College of Biological Sciences Petri dish. As some of you know, this is one way that we try to share our science with the broader community. And we're very happy that you've decided to enter our virtual Petri dish and be part of our latest experiment experiment. And I encourage you to be active participants. I can see that you already are. Um, for these conversations, we bring together people from our college, the university and beyond who have expertise and a point of view to share around topics of broad interest with a biological bent. And what could be of greater interest to us than the origin of life itself? Without a single agreed upon definition of life, this is bound to be an interesting conversation. What, if anything, is the bright line between non-living and alive? 
I'm going to let our panelists handle that one. We really can't help but be fascinated by our own rather obscure origin story. The details are still quite fuzzy, but as we inch closer, we get not only a better idea of what life is, also where else we might find it. As a sentient species, we've managed to come up with lots of possible explanations for where and when life arose, most of them wildly off base. There is a good reason that biologists never study spontaneous generation. We still have loads to learn, and tonight you're, you'll hear about what we know and what we don't about how our living planet began. So with that, I hope you'll join in with your own questions and comments. Thank you for being here and enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much, Valerie. Um, as Valerie said, um, so we do want to hear your questions. Unfortunately, because uh, you know this isn't a, a uh, you know an in-person kind of event, uh, we can't really do questions at the end. We've been trying to figure that out within Zoom and uh, and in the webinar format, it doesn't really work. So what we are hoping that you will do is, as you have questions uh, throughout the course of the discussion, please put them in the chat box, <clears throat> um, Claire who you've all met and is lovely, is going to aggregate those and she is going to um, then kind of put them together. And so hopefully we'll be able to answer um, the, the questions that have been asked most frequently. Um, and we'll break away from the conversation a couple of times uh, to uh, address some of the questions as we're going through the process. And then again, at the end as well. Um, <clears throat> so please do submit your questions. Um, the uh, webinar is being recorded and it is going to get posted online. Um, it's got to be closed captioned and a few other things uh, first, so that's not going to happen right away. Um, but if uh, you would like to uh, look at this or share this with someone else, um, it'll be on the uh, CBS uh, website and available for everyone. Um, okay, so enough of the announcements. Um, <clears throat> so now I'd like to go through and introduce all of our uh, panelists. Uh, they are fantastic. I'm really excited to talk with them. Um, for those of you that haven't been to a tea petri dish, um, I uh, tend to also uh, want them, in addition to talking a little bit about uh, what they do and why they care about those things, to um, also uh, answer a, a related but kind of um, tangential question at best. Normally it's a little bit silly, but on this topic it was kind of hard for me to come up with uh, something that is really silly. Um, but I am curious um, what they think perhaps the craziest or most interesting or most engaging creation story is that they have come across. And, uh, and I'll lead off with this. Um, I, you know, I always think that the, um, the Norse mythology creation story is really interesting. Um, you know, you get the, you know, well, well, where did people come from? Oh, well, the, the gods carved them out of trees. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. That's great. So where, where did, where did the gods come from? Oh, well, from the frost giants. Cool. Cool. Okay. So where, where did the frost giants come from? Well, they, they were created from sort of the original one, Ymir. Um, oh, all right, and, and where's he from? Well, a, a cosmic cow licked him out of some frost. Um, oh, all right, that's getting even better. Well, where, where's the cosmic cow from? No more questions. Like it just kind of, it, it ends and it's, it gets more and more interesting and in then it ends. And I, I've always found that to be really fascinating. Um, so with that, um, uh, and none of our panelists can now do worse than I've done, um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Borello, uh, who is a historian of biology with a particular interest in evolutionary theory and genetics. Uh, he's currently the director of the program in history of science and technology. So welcome, Mark. Um, if you would like to take a few minutes to talk to us a little bit about uh, what you do. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm I'm a historian of science. So I'm 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 um, I'm interested in sort of thinking about how uh, scientists get fixated on or get interested in or pursue particular kinds of questions at particular points in time, and how the way we might have pursued those questions fifty years ago or a hundred years ago or even longer ago different from how we pursue similar questions in the present. Um, and uh, when I when 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 you prompted us with the crazy uh, creation story, um, it doesn't have to be crazy. It could be cool. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I, well, I mean, crazy, interesting, engaging. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, there 
they're infinite, right? Um, and but what 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 I thought of actually was um, my first job. I was teaching at Michigan State University, and all the undergrads had to read um, uh, Frankenstein um, for their like summer reading coming in. And then we had like this kind of collective discussion um, about Frankenstein, and one of my colleagues at Michigan State, Doug Lucky. Um, who's a geneticist, developmental biologist, um, said, yeah, we create life in the lab all the time. And I remember the student coming up to me after the, after the, you know, the plenary session or whatever and saying like, wait, what you, they're, they're like, what are they doing? And Doug's like, yeah, no big deal. Like that's, that's nothing like, yeah. Um, and so I think like, it just made me think about sort of this whole question of origins and this whole question of what it means to 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 think about um, life. Um, and of course, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is 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 very much about that, right? And and not just sort of the science and the technology that Victor Frankenstein is supposed to be involved in, but also kind of the moral and the ethical and the kind of um, you know negative in, impacts that that might come from um, figuring out what the origin of life is and then having the, the sort of technological or scientific ability to make life. Um, and, you know, clearly we exist in a, a, a scientifically and technologically saturated culture where we can do all kinds of things, including maybe by some definitions, um, you know, creating life. Um, and so, what is the origin of life? You know, um, I, I suspect we'll be able to burn uh, 90 minutes talking about that. <laughs> it's not burned, it's a good use of time. Sarah. No, no, I mean, a burn in a positive way. Burning creates energy and releases all kinds of, you know, but it has bad effects too, but whatever. Yeah, so that, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so up next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Trinity Hamilton, who's an environmental and molecular microbiologist whose research examines microbial photosynthesis and global biogeochemical cycles throughout Earth's history. Uh, her research has informed outstanding questions regarding the um, physiology of Earth's oldest phototropes and uh, uh, contribution of these organisms to biogeochemical cycling in Earth's past, present, and future. Did I get it all? I stumbled over some of it. Welcome, I think, Trinity. Uh, I think you got it all. Thank you for that, <laughs> Alex. Um, I don't know what to add. Yes, yeah, so I'm a microbiologist, um, and we study um, organisms that are alive today. And we think about these organisms in terms of where we try to think about what they might have looked like, um, both physiologically, so in terms of their different enzymes and different metabolisms, what they might have been doing under earlier conditions. Um, and then we think about how like projecting into the future, things might continue to change because if there's one thing we know about Earth, it is that um, Earth continues to change. Um, I'll just mention that um, I often, um, in talking to my students, say that we cheat in my lab, so we study phototrophs, we study organisms that harvest light from the sun. Um, and those probably were not the first organisms. That's a pretty complex thing to be able to do to harvest light from the sun. So we uh, we sort of cheat in thinking about what those um, earliest phototrophs would have looked like after um, some other organisms figured out how to make enzymes and how to make lipids uh, and how to protect themselves with cell layers and things like that. Um, obviously, I haven't thought nearly enough about um, <laughs> Scientology, which is the sort of origin story that I would say is probably wildest out there, or one of them, um, as Alex has in his North Mythology. Um, but I just wanted to take a minute to sort of um, to, to recognize that there's such a rich history in, um, in different origin stories, and um, I think it's just a privilege to be able to work on through thinking about the, the scientific aspects of the origin of life, um, while also acknowledging that um, there's a lot of cultural and religious um, deep, deep history in thinking about this as well. Excellent. That was uh, well played. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you and welcome. Um, so finally, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Burkhard Seeling. Uh, uh, he's been studying uh, the origin of, of bio, the, the origin of life uh, biochemistry since uh, starting since in graduate school, I believe. Um, his work is related to uh, the RNA world hypothesis, and he now studies uh, primordial proteins. You've got to tell me what the RNA world hypothesis is in this, please. 
<laughs> Welcome. Hello. Thanks for your introduction. Um, there's a lot to the RNA world hypothesis that I probably won't have time really to talk about. <laughs> but to introduce myself, I, I think I want to mention that there are many, many, many theories out there on the origin of life and, and all the gazillions of aspects of it. But most of them, there are just that, theories. And I and my group that works with me are experimentalists. So we are biochemists. We like the laboratory. We like to plan and set up experiments and carry them out and see what happens. And so our approach to some very small part, of course, of the big theme of origin of life, um, we approach to answer those, those small questions in the big uh, uh, jungle of questions by actual experiments. So we don't claim or don't uh, even hope really to find out how life truly originated, because I, I think personally, I think that will never be really possible to say that for sure. But what we're doing instead is um, trying to, to come up with experiments in the lab to show that certain aspects of how life could have emerged are plausible by, by doing real experiments. So we love the experiments. We love the theories too, because the theories, they inform where our um, experiments might go. And we, of course, need hypotheses for our experiments. But in the end of the day, we love a good experiment. <laughs> and uh, in regards of the um, of the creation theories or ideas, or I have actually one that I can think of that to me really stands out. It's it's by far the most intriguing, and it's the one of the flying spaghetti monster. Oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, well, thank you very much, and welcome and welcome all of our panelists. Um, so I. To start with, um, I am given to understand from many online, and I'll be generous here, uh, we'll call them discussions or debates, um, that the origin of life is something that is distinct from uh, the theory of evolution. Is that correct? And if so, can you explain to me what the difference is between those? Does anybody want to dive in on that? So. I would prefer not to take those two things separate at all, because uh, the hardest part of studying the origin of, of life is really to define what life really means at, at the heart of it. And there's not anyone, no, no any one good definition. There are many different ways of thinking about it and lots of disagreements. But I think what many people agree, and not all, but many agree that life and the origin of life requires the emergence of evolution. And so I, to me, um, origin of life, and this is just one take of, of many others that are probably just as valid or maybe even more valid, but to me, origin of life is the uh, emergence of something that can truly evolve and get better reacting to the environment. Would our other panelists, oh, Yeah, Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, I, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's, uh, like a really interesting kind of observation because like evolvability may be a property of uh, like, uh, like, a, like a necessary property of a living thing. Like it, it, has to, it has to have sort of the capability of evolving. Like a chemical element doesn't evolve, right? It's just, it's just helium or it's just hydrogen. It just, it just is what it is, right? But, but living things can evolve. Um, and so evolution might be like one of the sort of necessary conditions or necessary components of, of a living thing. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I teach a lot about the history of evolution and I think people do like conflate evolution or yeah, evolution and the origin of life. Like Darwin's theory, at least as initially conceptualized was not about the origin of life at all, right? Evolution, sort of takes life for granted. Like it assumes that there was some er life, some original life, right? And then what Darwin is talking about is what happens once you have life, right? He doesn't really speculate. He doesn't really offer 
any kind of explanation or really much at all about where life comes from, where life comes from. He assumes you have sort of simple life. And then from that, given natural selection, given these other kind of mechanisms and given like a ton of time uh, and changing environmental conditions, then you get diversity, then you get, you know, adaptive radiation, then you get evolution. Um, but yeah, well, the way Burkhardt was talking about it as sort of like evolution being sort of a property, you need to have that kind of, I don't know if it's a natural law or something or some kind of cosmic force or whatever it is, but evolution is a, like a like a component, a fundamental component of any living system or the, or the, 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 the ability to evolve. If that makes sense. <laughs> So then, if this is the case, um, I guess that puts to, to rest in this context, that puts to rest some of the, is a virus alive? Is a, uh, a prion alive? Because presumably those things can respond evolutionarily, correct? Am I reading this wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I would just, uh, I would fall back on a philosopher's uh, uh, kind of phrasing of like the evolvability is a necessary component, but not, it's not sufficient, right? So, so just because you can evolve doesn't mean you're living. And so a virus can evolve, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a virus is alive. So Alex, as much as you might want to just put the question to rest and end the session right now, like, I think That's people, it, would argue, no, that wasn't people might argue like, no, 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 viruses do have some like element of, of life to them or something like that. So you're, you're saying then that evolution can act independently of something being living. Yes. I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to push. I'm going to push that on the biogeochemist. Like, uh, yeah, I, think I don't Mark know, can non-living things evolve? I mean, I don't Okay. Like, I think I, I understood Mark to be saying the opposite, that, that uh, the ability to evolve would be somewhere in the definition of what you would call life. And so it would be a characteristic of something that is, has passed from chemical to being biological. So then, so I'm, I, I feel like, Everyone knows that I'm about to ask this then. So then uh, computer viruses that could that could shift code, would that be alive? Oh, I shut them all down. Uh oh. No, no, no. This is very <laughs> intriguing. I think I read a book some time ago. I it might have been from Stephen Hawking, thinking about if you have a true, true, super, super intelligent. Uh, as a computer system that can not only be smarter than us, but actually is able to um, build, organize the building of robots and machines, and those then build new robots and machines, and those even can improve upon them. And then they could make little spaceships and send their robots and their computer out to outer space. Is that life that's traveling the universe then? Uh, I would say. Very intriguing question. And that's that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> at, at least momentarily, let's let's pull us back down to earth, I suppose. Um, so we're 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 focused on origin of life. And so if we're talking about the origin of life on Earth, how far back are we talking? Um, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm guessing we're talking about, uh, you know, little single celled things, or I don't know, were, were they cells? What, what do we think they are? And what kind of evidence do we have that informs those beliefs? I'm not answering it. Yeah. I'm Trinity, not. can you go with that? I'm I'll leave that with the professionals. The rocks. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I'm... I'm I think it's generally accepted that you had to have um, once once you sort of got more lifelike, you need a way to protect yourself from the external environment. You need a way to create gradients, and so the way that you might do that is is some sort of lipid bilayer, some sort of protective layer um, that you have, sort of whatever machinery it is that you're using, whatever uh, elements that you're you're starting to assemble inside, away from whatever 
um, might be, you know, toxic to you on the outside and or creating some sort of gradient so you can begin to pass electrons, um, protons and create energy. Um, so we're, I, in my opinion, we're talking single celled um, little tiny organisms um, uh, billions and billions of years ago. Um, I, I mean, the, the oldest evidence for life is still debated, and I don't know if we want to go there, um, but, you know, four billion years ago, um, <laughs> plus or minus a couple zeros, right? <laughs> sure, sure. So what, but what is some of the evidence that's used, whether it's exactly correct or not, I'm not going to pin you down to it. I know we're recording, but, you know, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what, what is some of the evidence that we have that suggests that life has started at those points? And I was, so I was gonna ask you to specifically, <laughs> yeah. specifically um, in this uh, case. Yeah, so, so most of the evidence that we have is in the form of isotopes. Um, and so several elements that are used by, well, many elements have different isotopes um, and, and life likes to use the lighter isotopes in general. And so um, sometimes we can find things like- Is that like a universal isotopes. thing? Yes. It yeah, like, we're lazy. Like use lighter right. isotopes. But, okay, but yes. so I have a question. I mean, like isotopes are much, much uh, like a much simpler thing than like a phospholipid bilayer or a single-celled organism, right? Like there's a pretty, there's a lot of complexity that goes between that and that, and and so like if we find a signature of some isotope and then we say like, oh, it, this is like a precursor to life or something, not this. This is a, this is like an environment where life could as we imagine it exists, but it's not sufficient to say, you know, yeah. we, we have life here, right? Like Absolutely. if we find some isotopes on Mars, we're not, we're not done, right? We're not satisfied. <laughs> no, no, so we need um, context of, you know, what the environment might've been like when that signature was formed. And, and when we're finding that isotopic signature, especially the really old ones, um, that that is just a, an isotopic signature. It's not associated. You know, we haven't pulled, we haven't found a lipid, for example, right? We're just finding that isotopic signature, and then we're saying, oh, life that we have today um, makes a similar signature. We do the same thing with sort of oxidation reduction um, uh, type things. So, so for example, um, we have evidence for when oxygen was first produced. Um, on Earth, based on the the amount of oxidized elements in the um, that we find in, in rocks of a specific age, but yeah, you're right that 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 itself is not necessarily enough uh, on its own. Yeah, I think the problem is so people, many probably some people in the audience have seen dinosaur bones, right? And that's amazing. That's really cool. We know there were dinosaurs, and that's really really long time ago, right? I don't know, hundreds of millions of years ago or something. And, and that's really great. And so why don't we just go and find the fossils of, of uh, origin of life, right? But dinosaurs is really the newest thing. If you look on the whole time scale of when there was no earth and then earth formed as a planet and, and we're here and the dinosaurs are kind of, kind of here. So going back to the origin of life is much, much earlier. And unfortunately the way chemistry works not only have we not really found fossils of living things, but we also probably won't really ever be able to find like a fossilized DNA or RNA or protein or so, because that's just how ke chemistry, chemicals that are more complicated, they, they fall apart over time. And over those very long times, they definitely fall apart. And that's why we have to go to something as, as um, well, almost spooky as, as isotope ratios, right? And and we kind of know pretty sure that a certain ratio is to be expected. And if it's different, then we have certain ideas of why that could mean that it's the reason is life until we find some other explanation, right? And uh, I, I like what that, that Hamilton, uh, Trinity Hamilton mentioned that the earliest traces or so, it's, it's a very hotly debated issue. And there, every other year, there's a big paper in Nature or Science that claims to have found some proof of an even earlier uh, uh, fossil kind of, it's usually in some rock. And then there's always a lot of people that have reasonable concerns why they're not fully following that argument. It's a very difficult thing because it's so far in the past. Is, so is it just an issue of it being far in the, like I, I imagine as, watch me be wrong here. 
I imagine as you know, play tectonics, hand wavy, moving things around that maybe there aren't as many old rocks sitting around. Um, but yeah, all right, got that one. That's that's one <laughs> one point. Um, at some point, but, at some point, uh, a lot of it was actually melted, and and that's why right. we lost the traces of the earliest days. That was yeah, right. unfortunately. Okay, so yes, yeah, so I didn't I didn't know that was the case, and um, so then, but also I would think that you know finding a dinosaur like you know a, a brachiosaurus thigh bone might be slightly easier than whatever earlier things we're thinking that are you know much smaller too. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I, I'm not even thinking of, of things like, I, I had no idea about the isotope thing. I think that's, that's fascinating. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wasn't thinking necessarily fossils, um, but, you know, I, and I'm wondering at this point in what we know, does, is there evidence that suggests that life arose more than once, whatever that means, on Earth, or it was it like a single event of like, you know, hot thermal under the ocean and boop, there it is. It's it can replicate. I, but again, I then there is a question to be asked there of what is a single origin in that case. We can say for sure, it arose at least once. <laughs> <laughs> All right. and, yeah, we, and, I, I, I totally agree with that. I have, I have complete yeah, confidence yep. in that answer. 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You guys are really helping out here. <laughs> you, can mean, think so, of, you can think of an uh, um, ancestry tree of, of your parents and your grandparents and before. And uh, if you make a really big tree, there are probably some parts of the family that were perfectly fine people, but they never had children. And so that arm of the tree kind of died out. And, and the same could totally reasonably be, have been the case for some other versions of, of life, right? What we see today is only what survived. And uh, even of the, the life, the origin of life that gave rise to us, many things have gone extinct, right? Uh, for example, dinosaurs, we've been back at the dinosaurs, but many more things have gone extinct. Most things actually have gone extinct. And so by, with the same logic, you can also assume why not there could have been other life also that was just not as fit and appeared and disappeared it could be true it could be untrue we just don't know let me rephrase of the extant and existing things on the planet do they seem to have a single origin or is there is there any suggestion that there is there are multiple things that led to what we are now as living things on this planet. I'm gonna have to pin you guys down really specifically here. I think part of what like the scientific endeavor is, is kind of looking for the common features or the natural laws. And so in some way, like we, we define life as having, you know, this set of properties. Um, and so like when we come to viruses, we're like, oh, well, maybe this doesn't have all the properties that we prefer, or all the properties that we want to have. Um, but I don't know, I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, it seems like we, we, we assume um, that there's some kind of LUCA, you know, last universal common ancestor, right? And, and you know, Darwin was like, you know, when life was originally breathed into a few forms or into one. So again, he's kind of non-committal, right? There might've been, as Burkhardt was suggesting, like multiple origins and it may have led to sort of multiple phylogies, but, but I don't know. I mean, I defer to both Trinity and, and Burkhardt on this, like, it seems to me that we kind of assume that there's kind of, I don't know, one form of life on, on, on the, I don't know, maybe there, maybe there are multiple forms of life on earth. Is that, I, what's, what, what do you what, think, Trinity? 
yeah, I mean, I think I think Burkhardt is right that we yeah we'll never know what what we don't know what is gone right, and so I I think because um, most of life does things in similar ways um, that the the sort of path of least resistance or the the um, the sort of most straightforward explanation is that it was it was probably one or one that made it, one that made it this far. Okay. Well, so, well, I mean, so Trinity, can I can I ask you like if so, I mean, if, if there are sort of if there is the possibility that there are sort of multiple originations, but they all have sort of similar biochemical origins or or biogeochemical origins, um, that you just have like you know kind of a parallel um, uh, origin, but not actually you know the same. Like that, that life in the prebiotic soup or whatever it was, you know, uh, four billion years ago, you know, popped up over here and popped up over there, and and they they continued on separate trajectories, but they are kind of like they were quite sort of, you know, biochemically similar in that early phase, and then once you get that, then you have all the contingency and other things that happen in a phylogeny that you know, so we wouldn't even be able to tell that they were sort of parallel, but but not actually from the same origin. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I think because we all you know we all use DNA, the same genetic code, like those types right. of things. So I think um, yeah. I, I don't know how we sort of um, get to. I mean, I, I guess there are arguments for for both ways, right? Like maybe it happened everywhere, um, or maybe it only happened once. And I think sort of um, imagining those scenarios. Uh, is, is a fun sort of thought exercise to think about what the probability is of, of each of those. It, it seems really low, no matter what, <laughs> which, which one you choose. So I, I want to, um, I know it's a little bit awkward when we do this, but I want to take a break and check in with Claire and uh, find Did out- Did you just call me awkward? I didn't call you awkward, <laughs> just my ability to break from conversation. <laughs> Well, so I imagine we have, there's got to be some burning questions from the audience. We have a lot of questions. We have a lot of really engaged audience members, and it's so That's fun awesome. to see uh, to see folks so excited to to hear about this topic. So um, I'm gonna maybe take. Well, first, I'm gonna to um, use a comment from Jane, and it seems like uh, one of our panelists saw this comment and liked it. And so Jane asks and and yeah, says, works. "All extant life." must have a common origin as the genetic code is the same. Arguments against this view. Nope. <laughs> All right, well, that was, I think that was the easiest. Oh, well, that was never, easy. Never go against Jane. That's, that's like the top rule in my life. <laughs> I mean, it's- oh. What else you got, Claire? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so with that, I wanna, um, you know, earlier we were talking about is, is anything that evolves, is anything that evolves life and is how does that all fit in? Is it an attribute? Is it, um, is it, is if it's one, does it necessarily have to be the other? And a couple other folks have kind of followed up on this question of evolving. And um, someone was hoping to first just look to define what, what, evol what is evolving and what isn't. So um, they used an example that oxygen doesn't oxygen evolve by taking over another O to become O2 and then O3? <laughs> um, that's evolving, isn't it? And, it? and it's not evolution in the sense of biological evolution, right? So I'm hoping that we can just briefly maybe address the, the biological context of evolution, um, just to give just to give that or earlier context or earlier conversation a little more context. So if someone wants to take a quick swing at just kind of so you're, you're giving a definition that, uh, for evolution in the context of how we're using evolution. Okay. I mean, go ahead, Burkhardt. Oh, no, uh, you, you popped up on my screen. Well, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I think um, it seems to me that um, evolution is not just change, right? There has to be sort of uh, selection and 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 heredity um and so uh so 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 different chemical configurations of an element are not evolution they're change for sure but they're not 
evolution. And they're constrained by sort of, you know, the laws of chemistry or, or, or affinities of different kinds of ionic arrangements or whatever it might be that sort of makes things bond or not bond. Um, and biological evolution is not that, right? Biological evolution is, is variation, heredity, and selection, among other things like drift and constraint and a bunch of other stuff. I don't know if that helps. And I don't know if Trinity or, or Burkhardt, you want to add to that or challenge any of that or refine that. No, I think that was well done. I mean, we define, most scientists define evolution based on the one life as we know it, right? And, uh, and then we say, oh, evolution is a sign of life, but it's kind of almost this kind of a circular thing here. <laughs> um, yeah, I, in my view, evolution needs to have reproduction. So you need to reproduce, but oh, yeah. there are certain chemical systems that can do that. Um, and then you need to be able to store your genetic information and genetic is already very specific, but something like that uh, in order to reproduce. And you have to be able to change to react to your environment. But even there, I, I've been on, on many panels where chemists argued, well, look, I have just a set of this set of chemical reactions and, and by really pretty much all those points, this should be evolution now. And, and it's a hard question. Um, but well, that's that great. Makes, and I know that's what makes this so interesting. <laughs> I know for some of us that seems like, oh, well, we've been talking about it forever. Of course, everyone knows. But um, I think it's important. A lot of people on maybe have that context, but some folks might not have that uh, maybe open ended formal definition the, of open ended is uh, open endedness of this evolutionary process. This is also something that many people consider uh, important because certain chemical systems they can change in response to the environment, but, but true evolution of life keeps going in directions that uh, nobody knew before, right? Yeah. So I'll do, I'll do another one here. Um, so this is from a Jennifer. It is my understanding that the second law of thermodynamics flows one way, except for in life forms, which use energy to do work to hold structure against the flow of entropy. Could anyone here speak to that? I mean, I would only say that it sounds like she's got that right. <laughs> I mean, you know, chemical elements, other things decompose if there's not energy put into a system. But if you have living systems that have a source of energy, then they can maintain stability, hereditary information, genetic, genetic information um, over vast periods of time because there's energy coming into that. But the living things do that at the expense of the environment, right? Because you can't break that law. Right. <clears throat> there's no, well, yeah, there's no free energy, <laughs> at least not for us. It'd be great if we had free energy and I wouldn't have to wear a scarf in my house. <laughs> Want me to do one more, Alex? Um, yeah, sure. I, if, it sounded like there were a bunch, so let's let's do one yeah, more. Yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot. Okay. Back Maybe in. I'll try to fire some off, quick, quick style. These some of these are are pretty quick for you all. Um, can the panel address how old the oldest generally accepted cells are, or maybe evidence? What, what has what what is the oldest cell that there's been evidence for? Um, and then they also ask about prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic life. Um, I, I'm not sure if you mean living or dead. Um, there is some really interesting work coming out of um, some really deep mines where the, um, the water is thought to be um, uh, potentially billions of years old. And so there are microbes in that water. And it is, again, potentially not um, impacted by surface water. And so there is an idea that cells in that, um, that the cells in that water or deep subsurface in the ocean, for example, some of these sort of more restricted or isolated environments might potentially have really old living um, cells. The, as we talked about earlier, like if we, the older and older the rocks are, the less well preserved, well, microbes don't make bones. 
um, they don't make structures that are well preserved. And so there are things called microfossils that um, uh, that um, folks, you know, drill into rocks and, and try to look for. And those are, you know, identified based on looking like cells today. Um, and so some of those are, are a bit more contentious, but um, I, I'm not exactly sure on the dates of those, but those can be um, or have been interpreted, interpreted to be billions of years old, those old cells. Um, eukaryotes are, are much younger. Ah, thank you, Trinity. Yeah. So here's another one, and then I'll let you. I'll, I'll let you have the rain. Sorry, Alex. One oh, more. One more. Fine. I can tell. Um, there's a. I can tell. There are a lot by, is, by your reaction. Yeah. Yeah, we've done a. You know, we've done a handful of virtual events in the last year and a half, and this is the most engaged audience we've ever had, which is which is really fun. So. Um, okay, so here's another one. Could you discuss the origin of biological catalysis in regards to the chemical origin of life? And before I have you all answer that, I want to make sure we define what, what catalysis is. Yeah, that was going to be my first question. <laughs> the, 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 define catalysis. Great, great questions, and okay. they are impossible to answer in, in the short time we have here, really. Uh, <laughs> So, so catalysis, uh, you need a what's called a catalyst. Um, and in biology, we call that same thing, this catalyst, we call this an enzyme. And, and that external thing helps a chemical reaction to happen faster. That's a very simple definition of, of catalysis and, and an enzyme. And as I already am leading you to, there are catalysts out there in nature. There are minerals that can catalyze a lot of things. And there are enzymes, and in my lab, we study enzymes. They are usually made from proteins, but there are also enzymes that are made from RNA. And we mentioned that very briefly earlier. RNA is similar to DNA, but not quite the same. We still have it in our cells, but it's also thought to have uh, predated the, the world where there was uh, DNA. So nowadays, the biological catal catalysts can be um, RNA or proteins, and mostly proteins. And are they important? Yes, they are very important because they give you an advantage over your environment, right? If you are the first little critter or creature or cell or whatever that might look like, you need to survive and you, have, you can survive by being better than what floats around you. And you usually need to shield yourself in a, in a, in like a cell, like in a lipid bilayer or something like that. And those catalysts, they can help you to do things more efficiently, and therefore I consider them very essential for becoming life. But they, but the catalysis and catalysts are everywhere. They are way before life, and they're on all planets and that are out there. So, cool. All right. Well, thank you, Claire. Um, we'll be checking yeah. back in with you in just a little bit here. Um, so actually along that theme, um, I, I wanted to come back to something that uh, Trinity said earlier that I, I kind of let go at the time, um, but now I'm gonna latch onto like a dog with a chew toy. Um, <clears throat> so she had mentioned that um, some sort of envelope, uh, lipid bilayer or some sort of cell type thing uh, would be necessary to protect things that were living like. Um, what, what do we mean by living like? I mean, and, and uh, Burkhard, you just mentioned that, uh, you know, some of these kinds of processes can happen that aren't living processes, right? Did I, so what are we talking about in that context? What is living like? Can you explain what that means to me? You have a good memory, Alex. Um... Sorry. Or a bad memory. I don't know. Um, I think I was just thinking in terms of somewhere on, the, uh, again, I don't exactly know where we start calling something life. Is it when it has this sort of genetic code? Um, but because organisms want to use enzymes and they want to capture energy, they want to protect themselves. So I, I think just at some point, um, I'm just going to not answer your question. Um, Perfect. In that sort of going from this chemical to biological form, you, you had to have a way to sort of uh, put things in a bag um, where where that came in the like I think that has to come pretty early um, 
on in the process because if you're making DNA and you're in a, you know, you're next to a black smoker and uh, with a constant flow of water, your DNA is gone, right? There's, there's no way to keep it near you. If you were, you know, hanging out in Minnesota trying to make a cell today, uh, it would have just blown away like anything you were making, right? And so there has to be a way to sort of um, uh, begin to, to keep this stuff in close proximity to one another. So I, I don't want to jump in if there are other panelists wanted to add to that at all. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask um, Trinity and, and Burkhardt, um, like, I, I know, f like, there are some ideas that like, maybe um, some of the sort of proto cell environments could have been like bubbles or could have been like ceramic kind of containers, you know, that were the clays that were organizing in a particular way where you would have sort of this 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 ability to concentrate whatever the molecule was whether it was rna or something more simple so that the reaction could sort of catalyze and not sort of get blown apart right is that still part of like what the thinking is with respect to the micro environment that's necessary for replication or for um you know proto life to start <clears throat> I think for the reasons that Trinity already mentioned, you need some kind of compartment. And, and the lipid bilayer is a great one because it can grow and it can divide, which is very useful for evolution to happen. But in principle, you need the compartment even more than the ability to grow and divide, I, I would say. So one could think of alternative systems where you can just find some kind of border. And if it's a pore in some uh, a very porous uh, material, rock material or, or so, why not? As long as you can avoid diluting with everybody else or the environment, that, that's the most important one. The, the lipid bilayer clearly has a lot of additional advantages and that's why, right. that's how we know life today, yeah. So, uh... See if I'm understanding this correctly. So there, um, there may have been, and I realize this is, you know, we're a little hand wavy here, right? But there may have been um, groups of chemicals or sets of chemicals that were lifelike in, say, a, a pore in a rock or between <clears throat> clay particles or something. But the key that I'm hearing from this is the prevention of dilution of that. Um, to, to the environment. Is that, is that correct? So if, if this is a critical stage in creating life as we know it, because um, we, we could speculate about other things, but creating life as we know it, um, then uh, um, how fragile was that process in the first place? And in terms of the likelihood of ending up where we are now, I mean, was it near deterministic or was it these processes could have happened and just stayed that way and never been life as we know it? Great question. Yeah, another great question. <laughs> um, I mean, we don't really know. We can think of a lot of danger to life we can actually nowadays to make it a little uh, up to date here we know of, of imminent danger to the life as we experience it right now right if the 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 um atmosphere is is damaged a lot conditions will change dramatically and life will change a lot to say the least right and uh we know of planets that used to have an atmosphere likely and now don't and so now they're very in uninhabitable, but they might have been more inhabitable at, at some point, right? So we can easily think of a lot of dangers to life, and especially when it's uh, emerging and probably still very fragile, right? When you asked the question, actually, one of the uh, participants uh, had a comment that had UV light in it, and UV light is very destructive. Not only does it cause us skin cancer, um, actually, nowadays, there's very little UV light because of our nice ozone layer that it's getting thinner, but it's still there. 
Um, but in, in the early days of Earth, there was no such thing. And UV radiation was much, much, much stronger. And anything that was any organic molecules that were uh, such as uh, contained in cells that were exposed to just normal sunlight in the early days, billions of years ago, would have had a hard time to survive. So many chemicals that are now in our cells would have very quickly um, been destroyed. Of course, then, so first part of my answer is, yes, there are lots of dangers <laughs> to destroy things. But we can also think of, of alternative scenarios. For example, if life emerged in water, then uh, water protects against UV light, for example. It right? doesn't protect against anything, and not everything, but against UV light at least. Or it could be a little below the surface. That's another protection against UV light. So again, we're now deep into the land of speculations. And maybe I should give the others an opportunity to speculate more here. <laughs> no, those are great points. I, I, I would just add that I, I think another um, sort of idea that has maybe gained favor again recently is this idea of silica gel. Um, and so uh, there's like there's a whole um, uh, group of folks that are sort of hot spring life um, origin of life um, proponents. And so the idea in, in many hot springs is um, fluids are super saturated with silica. Um, and so you can get these structures that form. Um, as that silica precipitates, it sort of has led to this idea that in these um, jelly, gel-like um, silica structures would have been the same, like Burkhardt is talking about, the same sort of protection ideas from UV, um, kind of a cell-like environment or an isolated environment where you can still get um, what you need, but be protected from some of these other um, harmful um, uh, things from the environment. So, so that kind of gets to uh, something else that I was curious about with this is, um, are those same processes that led to the formation of life on our planet still potentially occurring now, but they're obscured by all of the living processes? And I mean, I, I imagine if you're, you know, a, a protein molecule or a sugar molecule just hanging out around now, something might try to eat you or, you know, consume you or use you. Um, but so are, are those processes still potentially occurring, but they're hard or impossible to see? Or is that something that was, because I, I think, you know, as, as I think back to my, my schooling, whatever that may have been, um, uh, there was this thing that like, maybe it was elementary school teachers were like, the, you know, the, the early in, or high school teachers, early in earth, um, the conditions were, were right for creating life and now they're not. Um, is that true? The hot springs uh, make, makes me wonder specifically, but then any of the other environments as well. I wanna say, I like, I think one, one of the things that's interesting about that question is like, so we say we're not talking about spontaneous generation anymore because we don't think, right, that life is, 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 is generating from non-life sort of on a regular basis in the way that folks who thought about spontaneous generation did. But abiogenesis is that process, right? And so I think there is, there was a like historical- meaning life from not life? Meaning the, meaning the same thing as spontaneous okay. generation. Thank except you. Like in a different, in different words, right? Um, and, and abiogenesis kind of assuming spontaneous, you know, the folks who believed in spontaneous generation up to Pasteur thought that like it happened all the time, right? Whether it was at the muck at the bottom of the ocean or whether it was, you know, putrid meat would, you know, produce maggots or whatever that we, I think we don't think that for the reasons that you described and I saw both Burkhardt and Trinity kind of like nodding, you know, vigorously, like once you have life, then this changes like sort of the environmental chemistry, it changes everything. And now life is like in the process of evolving. And so you don't, you, you don't go back to those original conditions where there wasn't life. There was only sort of some molecules or some pockets or some, you know, the environment is totally different now than it was whenever 4 billion years ago when we think sort of, or we have the signatures that we take life to have begun. The atmosphere, everything about the earth is, is entirely different. And, and the earth, despite Lyell, 
and uniformitarianism and the idea that things only gradually change, like we've had six mass, mass extinctions, the dinosaurs being only the most recent. And so we've had massive environmental changes that fundamentally sort of change what kind of life, how much life, where life, all of those kinds of questions. Um, so I am not aware that anybody has found some alternative life if it is like emerging now or a hundred years or a million years ago, I don't think I haven't seen any sign of that. No. And, and the second part to my answer is a little bit what Alex even partly said in his question, which is you're going to be eaten. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> creating life when there's no life is apparently a very amazing thing. And we don't know how difficult it was or how likely it will be to be, happening again or on a different planet um, but whatever it was when life emerged likely in that place you were the only one alive so nobody's going to come and eat you but it, let's assume just a thought experiments there was life emerging just down the street tomorrow and it, probably because it just emerged would be very very simple and primitive but it would be different from its environment it would concentrate some some nutrient of some sort well it now is on earth and there are microbes literally everywhere and they will just happily eat whatever emerges there. So emerging life from scratch now, I would argue is so much harder than on early earth, not because the conditions are different, but because <laughs> your competition is stiff. Well, and that those are the conditions, right? Now the environment yeah, part is of full the of life. Yeah. It's full of microbes that are going to eat you. Like if you are some proto molecule or something that's seemingly delicious to a microbe, there's like probably plenty of microbes to eat you um, where right. there weren't before, you know, four billion years ago. Or you're probably going to be a, um, a not a great competitor. Um, and so you're going to, either way, you're going to end up at the bottom of the food chain in that scenario. Excellent. So I, I think I have um, a little bit better understanding of the kinds of processes that we're talking about. And to me, um, you know, in, in uh, her introduction, Valerie had mentioned like kind of this like bright line between living and non-living things. And that's that's a little bit how I think a lot of people are introduced to that, right? Um, and, you know, it comes from, you know, is a virus alive? Is it not alive? And, you know, maybe again, I'm uh, projecting back to high school or something. Um, but um, but I, I think it's fascinating the idea that things could have. So, well, I was going to lead in there, and I didn't want to do that. So, <clears throat> it was a very long time between when life started, we think, um, and life got complex enough to lead, you know, to leave fossils in the Burgess Shale and all of these kinds of things. Right? It was a, it was a fairly big chunk of time. Like um, so, how how far back then? do we push that if we're talking about chemicals aggregating in a non-cellular way? Like, does that, because it seems to me like a cellular envelope is not the easiest thing. Like it's not just, that's not just happening, is it? Um, or is that something that probably would have happened fairly quickly? Different aspects of what most people believe is necessary for life to emerge have been shown in the lab to happen pretty easily. You can, if you have fatty acids and some fatty acids uh, have been found on, on meteorites. So people take that as a, as a strong indication that they are a source of non-living chemical reactions, right? So, and if you have fatty acids, people have shown that under the right pH uh, and conditions, you can make little uh, vesicles, which are those containers that um, uh, look like cells. They don't have any genomic or genetic information in them. They cannot really evolve yet, but they, they are there. They are compartments just like what we would need. And under other certain physical um, stressors, people have shown that they can actually grow and they can uh, basically, those those lipid uh, bilayers can eat more lipid and, and make bigger ones. And uh, next thing you know, a shear force comes, so maybe a little stream of, of the surrounding liquid, liquid, and the shear force cuts them into two. So all those processes that are clearly very 
um, cell-like, uh, but not alive at all. But those have been shown in the lab uh, at, at, at not a time scale of millions of years, but something that we can actually do from like yeah. between uh, eight and five in the lab or so. <laughs> so lots of aspects are not as difficult as you think, but they also have to come together. And that's when it gets a bit, a bit harder. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So um, I have to imagine at this point that uh, we probably have another whole group of audience questions. There's Claire. I thought I, I, I should pop right up. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing there's a, there's another set of questions that uh, would be great to talk about. We do, we do. And I have a selfish question that is a qu just for me, but hopefully other people will find it interesting. So we started talking a little bit about kind of some of these early experiments when people were kind of playing around with this idea of how, 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 how they might test to figure out how, how they might test to figure out if, if they could sort out how life originated. And I'm wondering if one of you could speak to a little bit how those experiments were maybe designed and we don't have to get too in the weeds, but what were they, what were they working with in the lab and how that looks different from, from your setup today? And, and probably for Burkhard, this is probably the easiest question for him to take, I would guess. In terms Honestly, of what- I don't actually, can you just summarize it up again? I didn't get the heart of the question. Yeah, so like what, what do these experiments actually look like at the lab bench and how do what you do today compares to what people did a hundred years ago when they were first kind of playing around with, you know, chemicals in a, in a non-contaminated space? I'd be happy to talk about the, the latest, but I would love to refer to Mark first. What did people do a hundred years ago when they were interested in origin of life experiments? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, you know, there were early kinds of, uh, I mean, I, I think that there were like when we were talking about spontaneous generation, there were assumptions that life was sort of constantly popping up, you know, in various kinds of form, progenotes, uh, Monera, whatever. Heckel had ideas about this. Other folks had ideas about this. I mean. I guess it was maybe about a hundred years ago that like O'Paran and Haldane started to think about biochemistry and take a more experimental approach. You know, before the 20th century, folks weren't really experimenting. It was more like speculating, right? Um, and and it was really, you know, the, the Miller-Urey experiment in the mid 20th century in the 1950s, where they were trying to sort of recreate some kind of early atmosphere that might give rise to some you know proto life some 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 kind of molecule or protein or something that 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 would be uh, that would be a signature of life um, but you know biology only became an experimental science you know in the 20th century i mean before that it was it was very much about sort of observation and sort of a naturalistic tradition and so it was looking for things or looking at things not so much trying to manipulate things or engineer things i mean i think what's really interesting you know burkhard you mentioned sort of the idea of artificial intelligence there's also synthetic biology where we're now able to create different kinds of organisms or biological entities that you know don't naturally exist we can we can bioengineer and bioengineering is a relatively new kind of an idea so so i mean what did the bench look like 100 years ago um again the miller urey experiments almost 100 years ago mid 20th century um and and you know it was erlenmeyer flasks and trying to like put some humidity, put some elements in there and then add some, some electrical spark or add some, some energy and see what sort of pops out, you know? Um, and, and do we get some kind of, you know, what we take to be a signature of life? Um, but, but again, I think with, with spontaneous generation and, and prior to Miller-Urey or the experimental tradition in biology, you know, it was more about, you know, sort of what do you see and what can you infer from what kind of observations you're making in nature, you know? Um, 
I don't know if that's satisfactory at all. I, I could actually take your, your uh, lead and your nice introduction to everybody of the Yuri Miller spark experiment where they had this primordial soup and uh, simulated lightning to get some chemistry going without any life and found interesting molecules. And some of those molecules where, for example, among many, there are many things actually happened in there, but some of the molecules uh, were amino acids. And amino acids are chemicals that we use in our cells nowadays. And so they were very excited. And um, proteins is what I study currently in my lab. And proteins uh, rule the world nowadays. So your hair, for example, or your skin is made from proteins. So proteins do a lot of things. Proteins are enzymes, those catalysts we talked about earlier. And those proteins are made from amino acids. So those are the building blocks of, of a protein. And uh, nowadays, the proteins are made of 20 different amino acids. That's just how the world works nowadays. But apparently there is some history to it. And uh, the Yuri Miller Spark experiment found some of those modern, we call them the modern amino acids, 20, but not all. They found about half of them. And, and people have repeated these experiments in different variations. And apparently some of the modern uh, 20 amino acids can be easily made from non-biological processes and others uh, people have not been able to do that yet. So now coming back to modern um, experiments in the lab, what do people actually do? And I'm a little selfish here because I'm explaining what we do in our lab. We have this hypothesis. So if this was true that at the origin of life from non-living things, you could make about half of those amino acids, then what good would they be? So could you make proteins or those enzymes that were already useful? Maybe yes, maybe no. If you leave half of the letters out of our alphabet, it would be pretty limited, right? Could you still communicate or not? You will have to actually try to find out. And that's what we're currently doing in the lab. So we are taking amino acids in part according to this Yuri Miller experiment, the ones that are considered to have emerged very early in the history of life. And we take just those, not all 20, but just like the subset and we make proteins and we then, through uh, experimental methods, see if they can have useful functions, such as catalyzing a reaction. So there's actually a continuation from almost 100 years ago, one of those first experiments to what we do today and we'll do again tomorrow in our own lab. But that's just a small example of, of so many different people around the world that study the origin of life from, from their specific aspects. Many people focus on the genetic information. The DNA nowadays, likely the RNA in, in earlier incarnations of life. And many people focus on that. Um, but I think that's enough from, from my side here. I'm glad Mark brought up um, synthetic biology because I think um, uh, a really exciting um, uh, field now is thinking about um, reverse evolution. And so taking an enzyme that we have today, thinking about how it's evolved over time, and then synthesizing what we think that enzyme looked like a billion years ago, two billion years ago, and asking um, how does it function um, and, and what might it have been doing then. So that's a, a really interesting sort of way to bring together evolution and this idea of synthetic biology. Yeah, I agree. That was great. Go ahead, Alex. No, I was going to say, so do you, do you have an audience question for us? I mean, we have many audience questions. Well, that's Unfortunately, so great. We're not, we are not going to be able to cover all of them. I think we would be on. Well, to let's, let's take one questions. for now. All right. So, um, so, the that came up was, so we talked about cells a little earlier on. Um, and someone was wondering if protocells exist today at all, if those, if those are around in the environment today. There are many, there's more than one definition of what a protocell is. <laughs> and people, I think, generally think of it as a cell model, something that's not a real, really a live cell, but it has some properties of a cell, like what I explained earlier, just a lipid bilayer vesicle that's a container that can grow and divide, that some people say that's a protocell. Um, 
But other people also take modern parts of, of, of real biology that is alive and, and um, simplify it down, take only some parts and make something that looks like a cell, but it's not really alive anymore. And they call that a proto cell kind of. So there are different definitions. And so, yes, if we want, we could make something in the lab that is a proto cell. And uh, if you probably look around an environment, I, I'm sure some you know, vesicles form all the time just from just natural processes. Is that a proto cell? I guess you could say so. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there was like a paper, like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, Craig Venter's group was working with a minimal genome. Like, what does it mean to have like the simplest kind of organism? And, and what, what, what is the minimum number of genes that you need in order for this thing to function, reproduce, whatever? Um, and I, yeah, I mean, it seems to me that this is a very sort of like, a concept that doesn't have like a lot of agreement on what it, what it would mean to say like oh we made a protocell or we've made like the simplest genome or and i mean this is something that i thought a lot about over the last whatever day or two as i was thinking about this i mean origins are hard you know what is the origin of democracy like how how do how do how do we understand that what is a proto democracy you know what is the origin of science like as a historian of science, if I talk about Aristotle and his views of biology, is that science or is that just sort of philosophy? Or if I talk about, you know, again, Alex started the conversation with what what is what is the you know what are the creation stories that you know, like how does science differ from other kinds of knowledge? You know, what is the origin of anything? That's a super, super hard question. And so I notice in the chat that folks are like, well, you didn't even define life. How can you find the origin of this thing if you don't have the definition? Um, because life is like multivalent, multifaceted, um, and, and, and it's super hard. But I think that's part of what makes it, you know, fun. And that's what makes it sort of compelling you take an aspect of this really big problem, this really challenging issue. And again, I think historians are interested, you know, historians of science are interested in saying like, well, what, what is science? And I think biologists who are interested in the origin of life are doing similar kind of work. Well, what is it that we're after here? Or at least what sort of tractable element of this really big question can I, you know, get a handle on, make, 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 make some, you know, do an experiment or make some kind of investigation of that gives me some kind of satisfactory, you know, feeling that like, well, that's a little something <laughs> like problem is not solved. Chicken, egg, not sure. But like, I, I, I do know this about amino acids or something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> so, so that's, that's awesome. Um, I, I think, um, thank you, Claire. Uh, that was, that was thank great. The audience we'll, members. We'll, we'll circle back around. I know we're running out of time and there's a couple of other things that uh, I feel like I would be remiss if I uh, didn't, didn't come back to. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Burkhardt, uh, right before we broke out for questions there, um, you had mentioned uh, they were finding uh, lipids or some sort of biomolecules on uh, uh, meteors or some such thing. And of course, one of one of the other origin of life on Earth, like big concept kind of stories that exist, is uh, the potential for uh, panspermia. Right, the the idea that life might be spread around the galaxy universe. I I don't know where we're drawing the lines around that. Um, but uh, that it might be able to spread that way in a, some sort of a nascent form. Um, does that have any credence to it that we have come across? Or is this just a fun idea and a great way to sell sci-fi fiction? And anyone? <laughs> well... I mean, I think it's kind of funny that, um, you know, panspermia was like uh, certainly not originated with France, Francis Crick, co-discoverer of, of the structure of, of, of DNA with, with Jim Watson, but, but it, was, it was, you know, part of his theory. And I, I was reading something, I don't know, the other day where 
Lynn Margulis and Dorian Sagan said like, well, of course, panspermia is part of the, part of the explanation because like, you know, the earth is floating in space and, and like, yeah, it, you know, it, the earth is not a closed system, right? And so of course the earth is constantly bombarded by non-earth-like space particles, molecules, elements. Um, and so um, it's part of the earth's chemistry. I mean, Burkhard referred earlier to the ozone layer and how once we start trapping certain gases that changes sort of the chemical nature of the, the earth atmosphere and system. But I mean, I don't think panspermia means that like, oh, DNA came from outer space or RNA came from outer space. It was sort of like there are elements in space that, you know, again, where Earth exists um, that are part of the equation, that are part of the environment in, in, in some way. Um, so, I mean, it sounds weird when you're like, oh, yeah, life came from outer space. <laughs> but but I... But I don't think it's actually that weird. I mean, it's just that that space is part of the environment of Earth in some sense, at least until the atmosphere is like enclosed in a particular way. To me, it it wouldn't change the experiments that I'm going to do next week, because just like in your Norse creation myth, there. Okay, let's let's assume the somewhat fringe, I would say, idea of panspermia. And then what, where, where did that come from? Where did that start, right? So the problem doesn't go away just because you call it panspermia. So I'm not uh, a fan of that theory, but I don't mind it. And it doesn't really change much how I study possible scenarios of how life could emerge. Well played, bringing it back around. I like, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I mean, um, don't, don't one of you, Burkhardt or Trinity, don't one of you identify as an astrobiologist also? Yes, I definitely you, am an astrobiologist. Uh, yeah, I mean, and I think this is another kind of interesting thing, right? That the origin of life is, is not earthbound, right? We're, we're interested in understanding the origin of life, broadly speaking, you know, not, not just in this system, but in other systems. And that, you know, that's, I don't know, that's, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I know we're really, we're short on uh, time here and I have so many more things I want to ask you guys, but I do want to be able to get back to the, the last of, I'm sure what is a deck of audience questions. Um, so um, I guess I, I, I like to try to, you know, we've, we've ra our conversation has ranged from, you know, sort of, you know, what is life to what might it have looked like to how did it get here? Does that matter? As, as you guys pointed out, maybe no. Um, and uh, so I guess I, I am curious always um, for, to hear from each of you to kind of distill down, we, we, you know, great involved audience tonight. What do you want them to take away tonight? What would be the thing that you would want them to take away from the idea of trying to understand the origin of life? And I, I'm going to pick Trinity to start with. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, I would say that it's it's hard, um, and that uh, that it really um, takes a lot of creative thinking um, that no one no one would do on their own. And so we've we've covered quite the span of. Um, um, philosophical topic, topics and science topics. And so I think just sort of considering all of those things, um, uh, talking to more people, thinking about life on other planets, um, thinking about astrobiology, the, it just really takes a lot of us to sort of think create, cre creative, oh, creatively. Um, there's a lot of false uh, positives, right? And so there's a lot of, um, there's almost infinite possibilities for us to explore. And so I think we just have to have to keep trying different things. Um, and we may never, we may never learn the answer. Great. Um, how about you, Mark? Um, yeah, I agree with everything that Trinity just said. Um, and, but, but, I, but, but I, but I also say like, I would also like, I think that one of the interesting things to think about is, is, is the, the, the distinction between like, um, 
how possible kinds of explanations and how actual kinds of explanations. And I think both Trinity and Burkhardt in their labs are looking at how possible. I think how actual really does go to this question of, man, to try to recreate the sort of earth environment four billion years ago, it's, 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 it's technically almost impossible. And so we have these kinds of, we have a myriad of how possible uh, explanations and you know some of them are totally no good and some of them will build into other kinds of things and some of them will integrate with other kinds of things. So there's, there's just like a ton of interesting work. There's not a perfect answer. There's not a how actual, um, but I think that's perfectly okay. Like, and I think that's particularly true of biological science. There's a lot of, there's a lot of diversity and flexibility in biology, you know, which is why it's so interesting, you know, which is why it's so compelling. Thanks. How about, how about you, Burkhardt? So I really enjoyed this so much. I didn't really know what to expect beforehand. And I enjoy it because, of course, it's the love at my heart in science, but also because I learned a bunch and both from the panelists, but also from the people that ask questions in the chat. That's very interesting for me because it's important to get grounded and see what a larger group of people have to say or what they wonder. And, and so your question was really, what do I want the people to take away from this? And to me, it's very clear. I hope they also learned something here or there in addition to what they already knew. And I really want them to take away that this small thoughts have been stimulated and that they turn off the Zoom eventually and go and talk to their spouse or to a friend or tomorrow at work, talk to someone and, and just go crazy with, with just discussing the, the topic and thinking about it. That's what I hope this has stimulated and that's what I hope that people will take away from it. It's a, it's a great way to end. Um, so I, I want to go to Claire for some more uh, audience questions, if people are willing to stick around for a couple of minutes. Um, sure, yeah. Uh, so just as a, a heads up, it is 7.30. So for folks that had the 7.30 hard stop for our attendees out there, but our panelists have agreed, I think, to stay on just a little bit longer, um, if they're still able to do that to tackle some more questions. OK. So another, and I'm just, I, I'm just going to sort of start rattling them off. Um, so one is that do people imagine that lipid bilayers could form spontaneously in primordial soup? This is from um, this is from Jane. Simple answer. Also to make it fast, I would say yes. Yeah. This is the speed round. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now some of these are like. Uh, questions that are really big and I'm just going to kind of skip like that we uh we will we, only answer sort of yes, no, or maybe. we yes, can just no, maybe. Maybe. answer yes no or maybe <laughs> okay I like that I like that Burkhard okay yeah. why don't we know the answer to how life originated maybe <laughs> <laughs> I mean I, I mean that was like kind of a really big question right I mean <laughs> yeah that's maybe yeah <laughs> maybe yeah um, how soon after Earth formed and what were the conditions? And we talked about this a little bit. Yeah. Ooh, no, I'd love to break my rule here. Uh, no, go first, please. I was just going to say, isn't the current consensus among the scientists that it's, that it's if we think the Earth is four and a half billion, it's, it's getting closer and closer to, like it didn't take that long after, maybe it's four, maybe it's 4.3, maybe something, you know? A billion years ago, so life's been around almost as long as the planet. Is I'll break right? my yes, no, maybe rule also because this is fascinating to me specifically. The earliest life likely has happened so hundreds of millions of years after the Earth was really a planet, and then the life didn't really change all that much. And and I have to explain what I mean by that. Of course, I and you guys look different than a single cell organism. But that single cell organism has certain biochemistry going on and it's encoded in DNA and uses proteins. And people are pretty sure that all those parts to this single cell thing has happened billions of years ago, pretty close to 
uh, the time when life originated. So somehow, and that's fascinating me, and I don't know what, how to make sense of it, but somehow the first several hundred million years where that's where most things were invented, <laughs> if I use this totally wrong word here. Okay. Let's do, and I am just going to end with one more. I know yeah. there are more questions that we didn't get to, but sure. um, I do, I do want to be conscientious of time for, for folks. So, uh, you know, I actually like the one we just, we just talked about. I'm, I, I'm looking at some others and they're really kind of in the weeds and I kind of like the, the note we just ended on. So um, All with right. that, it's like, we're going to, we're going to end it there. Online. Pop back All up. Right. Yeah, I think we're going to end it there, but I will send well, the, the chat to the panelists. Thank, the panelists can kind of see all the breadth and depth of questions. Great. Thank you, Claire. Thank you to all the panelists. And thank you to uh, everybody who uh, participated and uh, watched tonight, especially everybody who uh, sent in some questions. Um, it was fantastic. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Alex. And thanks, thanks everyone. Claire, and Bye. thank you to all the participants. Very fun. Let's do it in person okay. sometime. <laughs> it was really enjoyable. Thanks. Bye, everyone.